The Wood Whisperer is brought to you by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921, and by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence. Okay, so the reason I wanted to do a live session in the first place, aside from, like I said earlier, just hanging out with everybody and uh, catching up with people, was the fact that there are a significant number of new users to the site. And that kind of was what caused our uh, crushing blow to our server that, that caused us to have to move. So now that we're on this new server, hopefully everything will be okay. But the point is there were just a lot of new users. We, I don't know what's in the water. I don't know what's going around, but there's a lot of people who want to learn how to do woodworking. So I thought it would be cool to go back and visit some of the, the basics and some of the things that um, a lot of us may already know. You know, it might be okay to review these things, but oil finishes and oil-based finishes are one of the uh, first things you kind of confront as a new woodworker as a potential finish to use in your shop. Uh, it's really durable, it's easy to apply, it's got a very uh, small learning curve, so it's a great option. And the problem with it is there's a lot of confusion out there in terms of labeling what's an oil, what's an oil varnish blend, what's just diluted varnish, uh, how do these things work, what's more protective, and I just wanted to review that stuff with you guys. So, without further ado, let's jump into it. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to talk about are oils. Because essentially in the world of oil finishes, there's like two extremes. There's the simple, extremely easy to apply, but unfortunately not very durable type of finish, and that's your oils, your straight oils. They go on really easy. There's zero learning curve because you literally just flood it onto the surface, let it soak in, wipe the excess off, and you're done. But the problem with that finish is that it's not very protective. It doesn't block very much moisture, and it certainly doesn't do a darn thing for blocking abrasion. So you drop something on it, um, you're going to dent it if the wood is soft enough to be dented. So, um, hold on. The laptop just went dark. Why you do that, laptop? I hate you. It was my uh, energy settings. So when we look at the world of oil finishes, essentially, you've got two things in the world of woodworking. One is boiled linseed oil, and the other is tongue oil, which I don't happen to have right now. I usually just buy these big, uh, big containers of the boiled linseed oil. It's just uh, cheap and, and easy to find. Both of these will be found in varying quantities and in different forms in a lot of different finishes that we confront. But just know that these are really the only two that you're going to find. Now, boiled linseed oil, like I said, it's, it's easy to get. Home Depot and Lowe's carry this stuff. It's pretty cheap. And for the most part, there's not a huge difference between boiled linseed oil and tongue oil. There are very slight differences. For instance, boiled linseed oil adds a little bit more of an amber color to the wood. Tongue oil is a little bit clearer. It doesn't quite amber up the wood quite as much. But as a result, if you're doing something like popping the grain and you want that uh, color to assist in that sort of popping reaction, boiled linseed oil is probably your best bet because it brings the most color to the situation. Uh, but tongue oil is generally considered to be the better quality of the two oils. In reality, to you and me, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. You might wind up paying more money for the tongue oil too. Um, so you're just better off, uh, in my opinion, going with boiled linseed oil. Now, to talk a little bit about terminology, boiled linseed oil, well, in the past, from what I understand, it used to be boiled, and it was something that would help the oil cure. By giving it that heat exposure, it would sort of polymerize it and get it to a point that when you lay it on the surface, it doesn't take days to dry. Well, nowadays, they do that chemically. They add dryers to the oil, and that's what helps it cure quickly. Now, when you buy tongue oil, you want to make sure, see, and this is where things get crazy. We'll talk about some of the marketing crap later. But tongue oil is something where, for instance, this says tongue oil finish. Well, that's pretty confusing because the problem is it's not pure tongue oil. So when you are looking for pure tongue oil, you absolutely must look for that terminology. It has to say pure tongue oil or else it's not. Uh, so in general, though, um, I think Rockler is a good source. They have some tongue oil. I think... Well, there's probably a number of places. I, the, I always seem to get mine at Rockler whenever I can get it on sale. Uh, but like I said, most of the time, boiled linseed oil is the one that I prefer to use. Like I said, though, generally, I consider it to be an inferior finish. Something like a workbench, where you want a little bit of moisture protection, um, 
you can't stop a workbench from being dented no matter what you do to it. So something like boiled linseed oil is a great option because it's easy to fix, easy to renew, and you're, you're just fighting an uphill battle if you coat your workbench with a film because you're just going to have to scrape it all off or plane it all off and, and you know, retreat it later. So tools, uh, you know, tool handles, workbenches, cutting boards, these are all places where you use an oil that doesn't build up to a thick film. So it's, it's kind of funny. It's almost, it almost doesn't seem to make sense. It's, it's a, the things that are going to get beat up the most are the things that you really are just kind of giving in and saying, look, I know it's going to get beat up, so repairing and refreshing the surface is more important to me, so let me just use the boiled linseed oil for the most part. Look at me, I'm all organized with my notes. So on the other side, you have varnish. So varnish is sort of the other extreme. It's a full-fledged film. It you know, can look really ugly if you put too much on, at least in my opinion. Um, but it's extremely protective. It's going to stop water or anything from penetrating the surface. And it has that nice hard film. So you drop your keys on a table. It's not going to dent. And it protects the wood that lies underneath. You know what, before I go too much further, I guess we should answer the question, what's the difference between oil and varnish? How do you go from oil to varnish? Essentially, to grossly simplify it, if you take boiled linseed oil, you add a solid resin, and you put in some thinner, and then you heat it all up, it actually changes to varnish. So to compromise now, varnish really protective, not the best looking if it's you know put on really thick and then oil on the other side is what most of us would consider really beautiful for the wood but not very protective so a good compromise is an oil varnish blend uh, you can make your own or you could buy them in a sort of commercial varieties i've got a few examples here most danish oils that you see on the market are really an oil varnish blend meaning they took something that was pretty much pure varnish they added oil, linseed oil, tongue oil, depends on the, the brand and the mixture, and they thin it out a little bit so that it's easier to apply to the surface. And typically the thinner is uh, either naphtha or mineral spirits. So if you make your own, a lot of you guys probably already know this formula, it's basically thirds. It's one third oil, either boiled linseed oil or tongue oil, uh, one third varnish. And in this case, this is already, I don't want to confuse things, but armor seal is already diluted for wiping. It's been diluted approximately 50% of what you would normally get. So let's say something like this Minwax Fast Drying Poly. This is full strength. So you would say one-third oil, one-third full strength varnish or polyurethane, and then you would have my mineral spirits is in the closet, but one-third mineral spirits, and that gives you a nice loose mixture that you can apply to the surface. It absorbs deeply, and you get the best of both worlds. It's not a super thick finish that builds up to a heavy film. I guess you could if you keep applying multiple coats. Uh, but it kind of gives you that compromise of a film finish protection with the beauty of a close to the wood finish. So certainly something to, um, to consider when you're looking for the ideal finish. I think it also goes up in difficulty in terms of application. The oils are the easiest to apply. You just flood it and wipe it off. But as soon as you add some varnish to that mixture, it tends to dry a little faster. The finish application gets a little bit more finicky. Um, you know, so it's a, you have to decide how far you want to take it. And the varnish at the top, well, when you lay down varnish, it needs to be perfect, you know, because uh, otherwise you're going to see streaks and things like that. So you sort of work your way up in terms of uh, difficulty of application. So I've got a few good examples here. Like I said, the Watco Danish oil, the Minwax tongue oil finish is a little bit uh, pretty much an oil varnish blend, something like this. The Armor Seal, we talked about that a couple seconds ago. Armor, Armor Seal is not an oil varnish blend, despite the labeling. Uh, Minwax Poly, of course, or anything like uh, Spar Varnish and things like that, those are pretty much just pure varnishes. Okay, so here's where the marketing stuff comes in. You will find a lot of finishes out there labeled tongue oil finish. The problem is tongue oil finish really means nothing more than a finish that gives you the look of something that was perhaps treated with tongue oil. So it's a very subjective phrase, a very subjective term. And you know it could mean two different things for the most part in terms of what we buy in a store. It could mean a true uh, oil varnish blend like one of these guys, or it could mean a diluted varnish, what they would call a wiping varnish. Both of those technically when applied to the surface very lightly, can give you a tongue oil-like finish. And that's why you'll see the term tongue oil finish. 
And that's why you also see the word oil on here because I, I don't know whether it's just, I'm sure they've done studies and they know what sells. Uh, it's their product. So they found that if you put oil on the label, it sells better than if you just call it polyurethane, like this one is called. But the reality is this is just a diluted varnish and these two actually do contain oil. So how do we see past the marketing jargon? I've been messing with this glove and I don't really need it yet. The idea is to, first of all, I want you to you know, read the label. Obviously, you need to know what you're buying, but then ignore it. Because what you really need to do is look at the back of the can. You could also look at the, uh, the MSDS. It's the Material Safety Data Sheet, and that kind of tells you uh, what the ingredients are that go into it. It can get a little bit technical in there, and some are more informative than others, but the back of the can can give you some very simple clues to tell you what's in this mix, to let you know if it's just diluted varnish or if there's actually some oil in that mixture. So one of the first things I look at is the way that they tell you to apply it. Okay, if the can says flood the surface and let it soak for 10 minutes to, to a half hour to even you know an hour in some cases, if it says a really long soaking period, then come back and wipe the finish off, there's no way that that's pure varnish because varnish, or diluted varnish, sorry. The diluted varnish would dry and tack up in that time. There's no way you could apply it, let it soak in for 20 minutes, and come back and wipe it with a rag. It's just, it's just not going to happen. So you'll find that these oil varnish blends will always have a soak-in period because the oil in there means that it's not going to dry. It's going to take a lot longer to cure, so you can get away with that. The other thing is, of course, the total drying time. If the can says to recoat, let me see what Armor Sealed tells you you can do. If it says that you could recoat within like an hour or two, or even six hours, you're dealing with varnish, okay? Because varnish dries within that time frame, generally a couple hours to, of course, depending on your temperature, humidity, and things like that. But the oil varnish blends most times will have you wait overnight to 24 hours before doing anything else to the surface because, again, it just takes that much longer to cure. So application and drying time are two clues that will always, well, I guess there may be some exception. I should never say always, but 99% of the time, it will clue you in onto exactly what's in that can just by the way that they tell you to apply it. And of course, check the MSDS if you really want to get into the details of, of exactly what's in that can. Now, if you're still confused, if you're not absolutely sure, you read some crap on the internet that tells you one thing, you're confused, the one test that always seems to work, and it's um, you know, very easy to do, is to get a non-porous surface. I think I may have done even an article on this at one point. Let's assume this is like plate glass. I have a nice square block of glass that I use for this. Take a couple drops of your finish, drop it down on there. It's gotta be non-porous so it just beads up. Let it dry overnight. If it dries and it's wrinkly, it's got oil in it. It's one of these. It's an oil varnish blend. If it just dries to a complete solid layer and there's really no wrinkles at all to it, it's just diluted varnish. And that's kind of a fail-safe way to, to do a test. For me personally, you guys have seen me talk about Armor Seal constantly. I mean, it's something that I, I it's absolutely one of my favorite finishes. And it really is nothing more than a diluted varnish. The reason I like it is I think that the quality of the resins that were used to make this are better than the quality of resins used to make the Minwax stuff. It may just be personal opinion, but when I see a finish made with this, it reminds me more of a finely lacquered surface. And when I see this stuff, it basically just, to me, looks like plastic. Now, another thing you may want to look a little bit deeper into, when you are looking at just the world of varnishes, you might want to pay attention to what resins are inside that varnish. See, res the resin is really the deciding component for how the finish is gonna act and look, uh, depending on whether it's a phenolic or an alkyd resin, or in this case, polyurethane resin. So then, that's a good point. A lot of people wanna know, what is the difference between polyurethane and varnish? Well, essentially, varnish is sort of like the umbrella term, and polyurethane is just one of a, a number of different types of varnish. So polyurethane is just a different type of resin. Um, and basically in wood finishing, for the most part, there are three resins. There's polyurethane, the, there are the uh, class of alkyd resins, and then there's phenolic resins. So I think, and some people will probably agree with me, that the alkyd and phenolic resins generally look more pleasant and less plasticky 
than your urethane resins. So you'll find that a lot of finishes, for instance, I think Armor Seal, can't remember which one it is, but it's a mixture of, of both urethane and phenolic resins, if I'm not mistaken. It might even say back here. Nope, it's alkyd resin. I get the two confused all the time, but it's a mixture. So that may be what, what my eye is seeing is the difference between pure poly and a, basically a hybrid mixture of poly and an alkyd resin. All right, let's do some questions, y'all. I can see the chat from here, so hit me with it, yo. Well, you know, gun stocks, you could find, I know there's forums out there dedicated to how to treat, finish, and handle gun stocks because, you know, people like to get picky about that stuff. I know, like, tried and true oil, and there are actually gun stock oil companies out there that's, you know, specify or specifically make gun stock finishes. I know uh, from what I've seen a lot, look up tried and true oil, but definitely do some research and, and talk to the people who know guns because uh, I don't know much about them, so I don't want to steer you the wrong way. Um, you might want to treat gun stocks differently than you would treat a piece of furniture. Okay, Har Harfoot or Harfu 2, Harfu T. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher everybody's name tonight. Uh, how can you make your soft pine table hard? You can cover it with hard maple, and that'll make it hard. If you're just looking to coat it with a finish that's durable, that will, you know, give it a little bit more longevity, you know, polyurethane is certainly a great way to do it. There are, there's, there are finishes out there that I haven't had a chance to really experiment with that embed sort of like an epoxy finish into the wood fibers that will do just that. They sort of uh, harden the surface and it's great for outdoor furniture because it really makes it impenetrable. Now we talked about this in the guild in the past and it's called, um, the one that I know of is CPES. Look up on jamestowndistributors.com. They sell a product called CPES and it's basically a two-part epoxy that you mix together. It's very thin epoxy. You let it soak into the wood and after, you know, I guess 12 hours, 24 hours, sand it lightly and then hit it with a few coats of varnish and polyurethane, whatever your choice is, and it does a number on, on the wood and makes it really, really protected. So now, I know that's good for outdoor furniture. I haven't played with it too much on interior stuff, but if I had a really soft wood uh, table, for instance, that I wanted to protect, that might not be a bad option. Chris asked, why did I dilute the salad bowl finish with mineral spirits? Okay, so here's the theory behind that. And mind you, this is only my personal theory and, and what I think makes the most sense for my cutting boards. Since it's all end grain, a cutting board is extremely thirsty, right? We were just talking about the end grain. It really sucks in finish. So what I like to do is take salad bowl finish, which is really just varnish. In fact, General Finish's salad bowl finish is really just one of their other products in a different can. Um, but they, you know, well, let's not get into that. That's also an assumption on my part, but it's, let's call it an educated guess. It's really just varnish. So what I like to do is thin it out because a thinner finish absorbs deeper. So what I like to do is thin it, I forget what, my, what I said in the video, but usually I thin it about 50% more than it already is in the can, uh, flood it onto the surface and keep applying it. Let it soak up as much as it wants to. And then when I flip the board over and I see it's peeking out the other end, I put the board up on the side. I wipe both sides clean with a dry rag so there's no excess on the surface. Uh, and then at that point, I just let it dry overnight. What I'm trying to do is to get that thin varnish to dry inside the grain. Now, if you use a full strength varnish, it's not gonna travel as far through uh, the pores and through the grain. Think of it like in the analogy that I use is the bunch of straws. The thicker, if you're, if you're pouring syrup through a bunch of straws, it's probably not gonna make it all the way through, but if you thin that syrup down quite a bit, it will. So the idea is to get it, you know, basically impregnate the wood, for lack of a better term, with varnish. So you do a couple coats like that and you really will wind up completely sealing it from the inside out. Whereas if you use the full strength material, it will soak in a little bit, but for the most part, it's just gonna start building a film right away. And on a cutting board, we don't want a film. We want it just to be impervious to water. So that's my personal uh, theory behind it. The best finish for alder. Well, alder is, although a hardwood is relatively soft, so 
you know, you're probably going to want to hit it with a little bit of shellac uh, as a sealer coat because it does have a tendency to blotch. And then whatever top coat you want, whether it's lacquer, shellac, uh, you know, one of these oil varnish blends or straight varnish, whatever you want, it works fine. Yes, polyurethane J-Dog can be thinned with mineral spirits. You'll find that any of these oil-based finishes, whether it's a pure oil, boiled linseed oil, an oil varnish blend, or straight varnish, or just, you know, Minwax Poly, all of that stuff can safely be diluted with either paint thinner, uh, mineral spirits, uh, uh, naphtha, turpentine. I mean, it's all sort of compatible. It just depends on what you have in the shop and... Uh, me personally, I just like to use mineral spirits or naphtha because I find them the least offensive to use. Paint thinner just stinks up the whole place. But yes, they're all safe to thin that way. Epiphanes go well over stain. Yeah, Epiphanes goes great over stain. Epiphanes is nothing more than varnish. A very, very good, high quality, flexible varnish. So thin at 50% and it should go fine over a stain. A waterproof finish that leaves the wood looking natural. The best you can do, Lex, is compromise because to truly become waterproof, well, I don't even know that that's possible. Let's just say to become water resistant, you naturally need to get closer and closer to creating a film. Um, you have to stop water from penetrating the wood fibers. The only way to do that is to block them from penetrating the wood fibers. And, and just because of the way things look when you, when you do that, you create a film that this, just becomes less and less natural looking. So it's always a balance. You can't, go, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So it's either got to be completely water resistant, completely protected, or it's got to be on the other side where you know, it looks nicer. So that's why these blends are really nice because they serve as a good compromise. I personally, I like to take just armor seal. I don't really mess with the blends too much. I think a nice coat of armor seal is absolutely gorgeous. So I will use just a wiping varnish. Maybe if I'm looking for a, a nice, relatively natural finish, I'll rub in maybe three coats of this stuff and then wipe off the excess. And it's pure varnish, so you're gonna get a decent amount of protection, but it's a really thin varnish and you won't get a super, super thick build. But again, it's, it's a compromise. Uh, I have used lye on cherry. Uh, Johnny Yuma asks, you know, you can do that. Here's the problem. It's extremely, you know, basic. It's, it's caustic. It's not really something, if you can avoid it, I would say avoid it. I mean, it works when you put uh, a basic solution like pure, what is it, Red Devil that you can get in the, in the hardware store or Drano you put a solution of that stuff onto the wood, especially it's primarily cherry, it's gonna really, really darken it in a hurry. But you know what else does that? The sun. UV exposure will darken cherry. Not quite as quickly, but it does get the job done. So I would much rather, uh, you know, put the stuff outside, let it catch some rays for a couple days, than hit it with a pure chemical. You know, especially one that's really caustic. Just personally, if I don't have to deal with that stuff, I'd rather not. Really, the two finishes that I think are going to be the least offensive to your senses as they cure are going to be water-based. Pretty much anything that's water, waterborne for the most part is going to be fine. Um, and then lacquers. Uh, initially the lacquer is very offensive, but I find after a couple days um, there's hardly any detectable odor at all. Uh, shellac is also going to be really good for that. Basically, if you're looking to avoid curing smells, stay away from what we've been talking about today. Boiled linseed oil, these mixes, and the varnishes will all retain odor for a significant amount of time. And that's why we never really use them on the inside of drawers or the inside of cases, because they will stink and they will make your clothing stink or anything you put inside that container stink. Wipe on poly and wipe on varnish, any difference? Well, this is like what we said earlier. Poly is a type of varnish. So when I say wipe on varnish, I could be talking about polyurethane that's just been diluted, or it could be some other type of varnish that's been diluted. But essentially, for the most part, as far as average terminology is concerned, typically you use those interchangeably. I'll say, you know, wipe on poly, uh, you know, when I'm really talking about something that actually has something other than poly in it. But essentially, they're, for the most part, the same thing. Well, there's a lot of different ways you could rub out a finish from the sort of old-fashioned uh, abrasive method 
using finer and finer abrasives to, you know, for instance, one of the things that like the Festool system, the Rotex system prides itself on is the ability to buff out a surface just using their uh, micro sanding pads. You know, it's, it's, it's good stuff, it's just expensive. Um, you know, I, I don't do it that often. The only time I ever have done that is when I used to work at a refinishing shop. Occasionally we get a table or a big conference table where they just want that super insane glass smooth finish and like as high gloss as you could possibly imagine, like piano finish gloss. And in those cases, you got a lot of space to cover. We needed machines. So we basically used powered buffers. We start the process with uh, a half sheet sander with 2000 grit sandpaper. This is after the final coat. We were using lacquer, by the way, that's important. A lot of, not every finish is good for rubbing out. These urethanes and uh, varnishes and oil mixtures, not the greatest thing. Um, they're really, really durable because they can take a hit. So they're, they're sort of soft. Things like shellac and lacquer, on the other hand, are really, well, they're relatively brittle. But if they're brittle, that means that they could be buffed to a really nice shine. So those are ideal for something like this. So this table would be completely lacquered, final coat would be added, and then we go through with a quarter sheet sander, we spray the entire surface down with water just to kind of lubricate it, and we're essentially buffing the surface and scratching the surface evenly all the way across with 2,000 grit. And what that does is level it. If you have any orange peel on the surface, you cannot buff it out to a, to a you know, absolute perfect shine. You've got to completely level it and have it glass smooth. It may not be super clear at this point, but it will be dead flat and smooth. At that point, you start with your abrasives. So that's really where it comes down to what, what you want. Now, what we used to do is use like Meguiar's automotive abrasives. It's typically a two or three part system of abrasive um, uh, you know, gel type material. You squeeze it out on the surface, you've got your buffing pad and you're just being careful not to burn through the lacquer. You just do the best you can and move up until finally your last step is like the swirl remover. And that was the process that we used. In the shop, there's a lot more manual ways you could do it. I've got a couple little containers, uh, I've made little homemade shakers of you know, rotten stone and things like that where you could put those on the surface and just progress through finer and finer abrasive powders. Uh, there's quite a few different ways you can do it. Is there any difference in using pore fillers with the different finishes? Well, pore fillers come in different varieties just like finishes do. You've got uh, your oil-based pore fillers, you can make your own pore filler by taking some of this oil varnish blend and sanding it into the surface. That'll fill the pores. Uh, and you can use water-based. Um, for instance, it's all the way over there, Timbermate wood filler is not only great for, you know, filling little cracks and voids and things like that, like a standard, uh, you know, wood putty would be, but you can dilute it in water and make an incredibly good wood filler out of it or a pore filler out of it and you can color match it, make it whatever color you want, spread it over the surface, sand it down. But it is water-based and it will reactivate with water. So you have to be careful what you then add on top of that. So if I was using something that was water-based, I'd probably coat it with some shellac to seal that stuff in and then hit it with whatever top coat I wanted to. If you're using an oil-based top coat, you could probably avoid the shellac layer if you wanted to because the oil is not going to pick up the, the water-based filler. <laughs> shellac is made of shellac. It's a, um, a lac bug excretion that's collected. And this is more or less a purified version of it. And you know what? Comes in these little flakes. They're very, very brittle and uh, dissolves in alcohol. And that's it. It's about the simplest, most natural, purest finish you can use. It's on typically on a time release medication. If part of the pill is coated with you know, a shellac barrier, the shellac doesn't really dissolve in the acid of your stomach. So when it first hits your stomach, part of the pill can dissolve then. The other part doesn't dissolve until the, the, uh, your, your parts, your plumbing, uh, becomes more basic. And then that dissolves the second part of the pill. And that's 
for the most part, how the, the time release stuff works. That's tricky. And you know what? There's a good thing that I don't know. <laughs> Every situation is a little bit different. There is the, that would be the major, major drawback to a varnish finish. We talk about it being more protective. Well, it's got to be because if it doesn't protect the finish and it, or the, the wood and, and you get something, you know, that really penetrates it, it's a very difficult thing to repair. The way you think of varnish and when you're comparing it to like shellac, uh, lacquer, even just one of these oil finishes, varnish is the hardest to repair. And the reason is think of varnish more like layers of plastic wrap. Okay, you put one layer down, let it dry. The next layer comes down, you let it dry. Those layers do not really intermingle. I mean, they, they lock down together, they adhere, but they don't become one. When you spray shellac or lacquer, every coat that you spray melts into the coat before it. So it all, when it's all said and done, is one thick layer of lacquer or one thick layer of shellac. It's called burn-in. You don't have that with varnish, unfortunately. So if you, let's say you get a scratch and you wanna just repair that scratch. If you start sanding and you burn from the topmost layer into the next layer, what that does is creates what they call like witness lines. Wherever you burn in, you'll see that ridge of the, the, the varnish where you burn in from one layer to another. So it becomes very, very tricky. The best you can really hope for is that if you have surface scratches, is that you can sand that top you know, layer, abrade that top layer just enough that it gets those scratches out and now your top layer is super, super thin and then you can kind of just recoat it with a fresh coat of varnish. But if you've got a deep wound in a varnish surface, I don't think there, at least that I know of, there's really not a great fix for that. Now, if you have one of these oil finishes, if you have shellac, lacquer, you could sand that, that one particular spot, get it nice and smooth, get the scratch out or whatever it is, or if it's water damage, get that water damage out, uh, and then just recoat it and the material just blends right into the old stuff. See, here's the thing with finishes, guys. You can use anything you want. If you're doing, you know, there are certain woods that respond better to certain colors, let's say, but really when it comes to a top coat, it's kind of, you know, half function and half preference. Uh, if it's something that's gonna be used a lot, well, then you need to protect it enough. Uh, like a, a, a dining room table or something, you know, it's pretty important that you get a nice durable finish on there but you can still put a lacquer on there uh, if you want to, if you like the way lacquer looks and you don't like polyurethane. But if you want more protection, let's say you, you know, you've got a family of five and you've got kids beating up on that thing every morning, you're probably gonna want a polyurethane or some kind of varnish on that table and you'll be willing to sacrifice looks a little bit for the sake of, of protection. So something like curly cherry, I would probably do something to pop the grain a little bit, maybe hit it with a, a little bit of dye and then sand it back to get all the dye off of the top surface so it just soaks in. Um, Pop Goes the Maple is a video that I did a while back, look that up, and that kind of describes that process. And then I would probably, if it's a, a, a use, like a surface that's gonna get used a lot, I probably would default to Armor Seal. If you have the ability to spray, you could certainly look into some of the other options like lacquers and like a pre-catalyzed lacquer is gonna be a pretty strong, durable surface that's gonna look gorgeous. It's almost like, you know, for me, when someone asks what finish should I apply, it's kinda of like asking what car should I drive? Um, you know, all finishes are going to do something. They'll get you from point A to point B, but there's a lot of questions that I can't answer between those points that deal with your personal preferences and, and also your, what you have the ability to apply. I did a video on that, called Desert Outdoor Finish. Just look that up on the site. And the recommended finish that I used for that, I wanted something that was repairable to some extent. I knew it would require a little bit of, you know, refreshing every couple of years, just by nature. Our heat here is just insane in Arizona. So what I did was I took a really high quality outdoor varnish. This is Epiphanes. Uh, diluted it a little bit with mineral spirits, so it's a little bit more of a wipe-on formula, and also added some boiled linseed oil to it, essentially creating an outdoor version 
of one of these, a Danish oil, or this tongue oil finish from Minwax. It's an oil varnish blend. And putting that on the door was great. It worked really, really well. So every couple of years, I just go back, uh, sand it lightly, and then I add a fresh coat of this mixture, and it, it works really well. Uh, what I find, though, is after a while, those pores really, they get sealed up. And the more sealed those pores are, the less likely it is to cure when you've got the oil in there, because this oil really requires a porous surface for it to cure properly. So I tend to go a lot stronger on the varnish and just give it a nice light coat of, uh, of the wiping varnish. And this is now like four years into it, three years. Do I put the same number of coats on all surfaces? That's a good question, no. Um, I make sure that all surfaces are sealed. There's a point when the surface is, is truly sealed. It's not going to absorb any more finish or any liquid for that matter, especially when we're talking about varnishes. At that point, on certain surfaces, maybe the inside of a cabinet, the bottom uh, of a table, I'm not too concerned about the final maybe two coats or something like that. As long as the first two or three coats go on, it's nice and sealed up, I'm really happy. The top gets the full treatment. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not a bad idea, but I don't think it's completely necessary to go through the entire finish regimen from coat one to coat five on the underside of a surface.